Now, anyone driving along Route 16 near Fayetteville in West Virginia at any time in the last almost 40 years would have certainly passed what many considered to have been one of the most saddest of all billboards they'd ever laid their eyes on. The billboard had five grainy images of young children with their names stenciled below each of their portraits. They were, by name, 14-year-old Morris, Martha, who was 12, Louis, who was 9, eight-year-old Jenny, and finally young Betty, who was only five years old. Now, below their names was an outlined idea of what may have happened to them on Christmas Eve 1945, and it is something that continues to be the subject of great debate, even to this day. Now, what is known about this case is that on Christmas Eve 1945, George and Jenny Sodder, along with nine of their ten children, their eldest or their second eldest son, Joseph, who was aged 21, was at the time away serving with the military. Now, the parents and their nine children each retired to their respective beds, no doubt eagerly awaiting the celebrations and surprises of the day to come. But sadly, what should have been a day of fun and cheer soon turned into a day of incredible sadness and loss. At around 0100 hours in the early morning, the parents, along with four of their children, managed to escape a fire that had mysteriously engulfed their home. And sadly, the remaining five children were never seen nor heard from again. But before we get into the main story, I'd like to ask, if you haven't already, to please subscribe to this, my new channel. I try to upload on a regular basis, but there are times when my working schedule or family matters take precedence. Now, if, however, that changes and I can devote more time to this project, then I'm hoping to upload at least once a week, maybe twice if time permits. So please, slap that subscriptions button and drop kick that notifications bell so that you'll be updated as and when new content gets uploaded to the channel. But now, without further ado, but now, without further ado, let's check out what we do know about the mysterious disappearance of the Sodder children here on the flip side. Now, George Sodder was born Giorgio Sodu in Tula, Sardinia, in 1895, and in 1908, when he was aged just 13 years old, he, along with an older brother, jumped onto a ship with the dream of starting a new life in America. The two young boys wouldn't be having any adventures together in the new land, though, because, strangely, no sooner had they arrived at Ellis Island, the older brother abruptly jumped onto another ship in order to return to Italy, thus leaving George on his own. Now, being an industrious young man, he soon found work in, on the Pennsylvania railroads carrying water and supplies to the laborers, and after a few years had saved enough money to move to Smithers, West Virginia. Smart and ambitious, he first worked as a driver and then eventually launched his own trucking company where he would spend his time hauling dirt for construction projects and later expanded into delivering freight and driving coal. And it was on one blissfully warm summer's day that, as a young man, he walked into a local music store and met the owner's daughter, a young lady by the name of Jenny Cipriani. She had also come over from Italy when she was three years old. After a whirlwind romance, the young couple were married and George and Jenny would go on to have 10 children between 1923 and 1943, eventually settling in Fayetteville, West Virginia, an Appalachian town with a small but active Italian immigrant community. The Sodders were said by one county magistrate to be one of the most respected middle-class families around. George held strong ambitions about everything from business to current affairs and politics, but was, for some reason, reticent to talk about his youth and he never explained to anybody, not even his wife, what had happened to him back in Italy in order to make him want to leave and come to America. Now, on the fateful day at around midnight on Christmas Eve, the young children, after having each opened one present, which was like the family tradition, everyone had gone to sleep. Now, it wasn't long before the shrill ringing of the telephone broke the quiet and Jenny rushed to answer it. An unfamiliar female voice asked for an unfamiliar name and Jenny noted that there was raucous laughter and glasses clinking in the background, assuming that somebody under the influence of alcohol had simply made a wrong call. Jenny responded by saying, I'm sorry, but you must have the wrong number, and diligently hung up. 
Tiptoeing back to bed, she noted that all of the downstairs lights were still on and that the curtains were open and that the front door was also unlocked. Now, as any housewife would do, she made the rounds of the house, making sure that it was safe and secure for the night. She saw her, that her daughter, Marion, was sleeping on the sofa in the living room and therefore assumed that the other children were upstairs in their beds. After going to bed, she was about to doze off once again when she was awoken by a large, sharp, loud bang on the roof. This was followed by the ominous sound of something rolling down the slanted tiles. Wondering if she was ever going to get to sleep, she was aroused once more an hour later, but more ominously this time, it was by the presence of thick, acrid smoke curling under the door to into their bedroom. Now, on being violently shaken awake, George set about trying as best he could to rescue the children. In such a situation, one can never really determine how you'd act given the craziness of that situation and the peril that, that, that was presented to the family unit. Now, after some time, George was able to take stock of what he knew. Two-year-old Sylvia, whose crib had been in his bedroom, was safe and outside, as was 17-year-old Marion, who'd been sleeping on the sofa downstairs, and the two eldest sons, George, uh, aged 23, and 16-year-old George Jr. The, these two boys had fled the upstairs bedroom that they shared, singeing their hair on the way out. George then figured that Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny and Betty still had to be up there, cowering in the two bedrooms on each side of the hallway, separated by a staircase that was now engulfed in flames. George had tried to save them, breaking a window to re-enter the house in, and in doing so slicing a massive swathe of skin from his arm. He couldn't see anything through the smoke or the fire, which had swept through all of the downstairs rooms by this time, including the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, his office and both his bedrooms and the bedrooms of his two young sons. He raced back outside hoping to reach them through an upstairs window, only to find that the ladder that he always kept propped against the house had strangely disappeared. He then had, a, had an idea that he would drive one of his two coal trucks up, up to the house and climb on top of it in order to reach the windows. But even though they'd functioned perfectly the, the day before, neither of his trucks would start. He racked his mind for another option. He tried to scoop water from a rain barrel, but found it had frozen solid. Five of his children were stuck somewhere inside those great whipping ropes of smoke. He didn't notice that his arm was slick with blood or that his voice hurt from screaming their names. Now, in order to raise the alarm, his daughter Marion sprinted to a neighbor's home to call the Fayetteville Fire Department, but couldn't get any operator response. A neighbour who saw the blaze made a call from a nearby tavern, but again, no operator responded. Exasperated, the neighbour drove into town and tracked down the fire chief, F.J. Morris, who initiated Fayetteville's version of a fire alarm, a phone tree system where one firefighter phoned another who phoned another and so on and so forth until the whole crew were together. Now, the fire department was only two and a half miles away from the Sodder House, but the crew didn't arrive until 8 a.m., almost seven hours after Jenny had first been awakened by the smoke coming into her room. Needless to say, by that time, the Sodden's home had been reduced to a smoking pile of ash. So George and Jenny assumed that five of their children were dead, but a brief search of the grounds on Christmas Day turned up no trace of remains. Chief Morris suggested that the blaze had been hot enough to completely cremate the bodies. A state police inspector combed the rubble and suggested that the fire was due to faulty wiring. George eventually covered the basement with five feet of dirt, intending to preserve the site as a memorial to his lost children. The coroner's office eventually issued five death certificates just before the new year, suggesting that the cause of death was down to fire or suffocation. Now, refusing to accept the tragedy, Jenny couldn't understand how five children could perish in a fire and yet leave no trace of ever even having been there. No bones, no flesh, nothing. It was as if they had simply vanished into thin air. Now, desperate for answers, as any mother would be, Jenny embarked on her own hunches and conducted a private experiment, burning animal bones. Uh, chicken bones, beef joints, pork chop bones, etc., to see if the fire consumed them. Now, each time she was left with a heap of charred bones. 
she knew that remains of some description of various household appliances had been also found in the burned out basement, still identifiable. And in her search for more conclusive answers, an employee at a crematorium also informed her that human bones remained in incinerators after bodies had burned for some two hours uh, at a temperature of some 2,000 degrees. And the solder house was destroyed by fire in just 45 minutes. Given all of these unanswered questions, both George and Jenny soon began to wonder if their children were, in fact, still alive. The sodders planted flowers across the space where their, ch where their house want had once stood and began to stitch together a series of odd moments leading up to the fire. There was a stranger who appeared at the home a few months earlier back in the fall, asking about any hauling work. He meandered to the back of the house, pointing out two separate fuse boxes and said to George that this is going to cause a fire someday. At the time, George thought it was strange especially seeing as he'd just had the wiring checked by the local power company, which pronounced it to be in fine condition. Around the same time, another man tried to sell the family life insurance and became irate when George declined. He reacted in a way that shocked even George, who was obviously a man of the world, by the following. Your goddamn house is going to go up in smoke, he warned, and your children are going to be destroyed, and you're going to get some for the dirty remarks you've been making about Mussolini. And George was, indeed, outspoken about his dislike for the Italian dictator, occasionally engaging in heated arguments with other members of Fayetteville's Italian community. But at the time, he never gave the man's threats any second thought. The older Sodder son also recalled something peculiar. Just before Christmas, they noted a man parked along US Highway 21, intently watching the younger Sodder kids as they came home from school. As suggestions as to what had caused the fire multiplied, so did the questions they raised. A telephone repairman had told the Sodders after the blaze that the lines appeared to have been cut and not burned. Now, if that was the case, then the lines would have had to have been cut only after the strange phone call that Jenny Sadder had received that very same night. They also realised that if the fire had been electrical, at some, as some people suggested, and as the official fire report had concluded, then power to the house would have been dead. But this wouldn't explain how the downstairs rooms were illuminated with lighting from the house, as seen by Jenny after receiving the phone call. Just an hour or so before, the smoke woke her up. Now, one sadder element that raised questions to both parents and the others who witnessed the fire was the lack of odour. When a house burns with human occupants, there tends to be a very defined stench of burning flesh that hangs in the air. Alas, there was no such smell remembered by any of the surviving family members, parents included, during the time that the house was ablaze. And sometime after the fire, and as the family were trying to return to some semblance of normality, their youngest daughter Sylvia found a hard rubber object while playing in the yard. Now Jenny recalled hearing the hard thud on the roof followed by the rolling sound on the night of the fire before falling asleep. George concluded that what he was holding in his hand was the remains of a napalm or pineapple bomb hand grenade, the type that was used in war. Now in the weeks, months and years after the disappearances, along came obviously the reports of sightings. A woman in the town claimed to have seen the missing children peering out from a passing car while the fire was still in progress. A woman operating a tourist stop between Fayetteville and Charleston, some 50 miles west, said she saw the children the morning after the fire. I served them breakfast, she told the police. There was a car with Florida license plates in the, in the tourist court too. Now, a woman at a Charleston hotel saw the children's photo in a newspaper and said that she had seen four of the five children a week after the fire. The children were being accompanied by two women and two men, all of Italian extraction, she said. Now, in her statement, she continued that, I, do not, I don't exactly remember the date that I saw them. However, the entire party did register at the hotel and stayed in a large room with several beds, and they checked in sometime around midnight. Now, I tried to talk to the children in a friendly manner, but the men of the group appeared hostile and refused to allow me to talk to the children. Now, one of the guys who I took as being the ringleader looked at me angrily before spinning around and talking rapidly and rather loudly in Italian to the group 
and immediately the whole party stopped talking to me. So I sensed that I was being frozen out, and so I, I said nothing more. They left early the next morning, and I never saw them again. Now, two years after the fire, in 1947, George and Jenny sent a letter about the case to the Federal Bureau of Investigations, and they were surprised when they received a reply from J. Edgar Hoover himself, which read, Although I would like to be of service, the matter related appears to be of local character and does not come within the investigative jurisdiction of this Bureau. Hoover's agents said they would assist if they could get permission from the local authorities, but both the Fayetteville Police and Fire Department declined the offer. Now, as doors in the investigation, uh, as the Sodders saw them, closed, they would go off on tangents in the hope to find and open new ones. Eventually, George engaged the services of a private investigator named C.C. Tinsley, who discovered that the insurance salesman who had threatened George was in fact a member of the coroner's jury that deemed the fire accidental. He also heard a curious story from a Fayetteville minister about F.J. Morris, the fire chief at the time of the fire. Although Morris had claimed no remains were found, he supposedly confided uh, in a third party that he had discovered a heart in the ashes. He hid it inside a dynamite box and buried it at the scene. Now the private detective Tinsley persuaded Morris to show him the spot and together they dug up the box and took it straight to the local funeral director who poked and prodded the heart and concluded that it was in fact beef liver and that it, were, and it had been untouched by the fire. And soon afterwards, the Sodders heard rumours that the fire chief had told others that the contents of the box had not been found in the fire at all, and that he had buried the beef liver in the rubble in the hope that finding any remains would placate the family enough to stop the investigation. Now, over the next few years, the tips and leads continued to come in. George saw a newspaper photo of schoolchildren in New York City and was convinced that one of them was his daughter, Betty so he drove all the way to Manhattan in search of the child, but her parents refused to speak to him. In August 1949, the Sodders decided to mount a new search at the fire scene and brought in a Washington, D.C. pathologist by the name of Oscar B. Hunter. Now, the subsequent excavation was thorough and successful to a point. Several smaller objects were found, damaged coins, a partly burned dictionary, and something that bore potentially greater significance were several shards of what appeared to be human vertebrae. Now, Hunter sent the bones to the Smithsonian Institute, which issued the following report. The human bones consist of four lumbar vertebrae belonging to one individual. Since the transverse recesses are fused, the age of this individual at death should have been 16 or 17 years of age. The top limit of age should be about 22, since the centra, which normally fuse at 23 years, uh, are still unfused. Now, on this basis, the bones show greater skeletal maturation than one would expect for a 14-year-old boy, the oldest of the missing uh, sodder children. But it is, however, possible, although not probable, for a boy of 14 and a half years old to show 16 to 17-year-old maturation in these vertebrae. The vertebrae also showed no evidence that they had been exposed to fire, the report continued, and it is very strange that no other bones were found in the allegedly careful excavation of the basement of the house. Noting that the house reportedly burned for just 45 minutes, it said that one would expect to find the full skeletal remains of the five children, rather than only four vertebrae. The bones, the report concluded, were therefore most likely to have been in, found in the supply of dirt that George used to fill the basement to create the memorial for his children. The Smithsonian report prompted two hearings at the Capitol in Charleston, after which Governor Oki L. Patterson and State Police Superintendent W. E. Burchett told the Sodders that their search was hopeless and declared the case closed. Undeterred, George and Jenny erected the billboard along Route 16 and passed out flyers offering a massive $5,000 reward at the time for information leading to the recovery of their children. They subsequently increased that reward amount to $10,000. Now, a while later, a letter arrived from a woman in St. Louis saying that the oldest girl, Martha, was in a convent. Another tip came from Texas, where a patron in a bar overheard an incriminating conversation about a long-ago Christmas Eve fire in West Virginia. 
Someone in Florida claimed the children were staying with a distant relative of Jenny's. Now, George travelled the country in order to investigate each lead, always returning home without any answers. And in 1968, more than 20 years after the fire, Jenny went to get the mail and found an envelope addressed to only her. It was postmarked in Kentucky, but strangely bore no return address, which was customary at the time. Inside was a photo of a man in his mid-twenties, and on the flip side, a cryptic handwritten note read, Louis Sodder, I love Brother Frankie. Now, neither Jenny nor George could deny the resemblance to their Louis, who was nine at the time of the fire. Beyond the obvious similarities, dark curly hair, dark brown eyes, they had the same straight long nose and the same upward tilt on their left eyebrow. Once again, they hired a private detective and sent him to Kentucky in order to investigate further. But sadly, they never heard from him again. This prompted some people to suggest that there was evidence that could have linked this person as being one of the Sodder children. But the private detective had simply had his silence bought by the family of the boy in question. In relation to the letter, both George and Jenny feared that if they published any information about that letter or the name of the town that was on the postmark, they may harm the boy that they then thought to be their long lost son, Louis. Instead, they amended the billboard to include the updated image of Louis and also hung an enlarged version of that same photograph over their fireplace. Time is running out for us, George would later say in an interview, but we only want to know if they did die in the fire. We need to see evidence to back that up and we need to be convinced. Failing that, and as any parent in our shoes would demand, we want to know what happened to our children. Sadly, George died a year later in 1968, and he died still hoping for a break in the case. Jenny erected a fence around her property and began adding rooms to her home, building layer after layer between her and the outside. And since the fire, she is only ever dressed in black, exclusively black, as a sign of mourning, and she continued to do so until her own death in 1989. Now, with the parents gone, the billboard finally was taken down, Jenny and George's children and grandchildren continued the investigation and came up with theories of their own. Now, these included suggestions that the local mafia had tried to recruit George, but he had declined, that they, the mafia, had also tried to extort money from him, but again, he refused their demands. Some suggest that the, the children were kidnapped by someone they knew for whatever reason, and that that somebody had burst into their rooms and told them about the fire and offering to take them to somewhere safe. Now, the youngest and last surviving Sodder child, Sylvia, who is now 77, and like her parents before her, she doesn't believe her siblings perished in the fire. When time permits, she visits crime sleuthing websites and engages with people still interested in her family's mystery. Her very first memories are from that night in 1945, when aged just two years old, and she would never forget the sight of her father bleeding or the terrible symphony of everybody's screams. And she is no closer now than she was back then as to understanding whatever happened to her siblings, or in fact, where they ended up. So there you have it, the mysterious case of the Sodder family and the five younger family members who all simply seem to have disappeared without a trace on that fateful Christmas Eve back in 1945. Now, it's not the kind of Christmas present anybody would want, and it's not something you would wish on your worst enemy, that's for sure. Now, as always, if you like this story and you want to hear more of the same, then I'd ask that you give that subscriptions button a good old smack and drop kick the notifications bell so that you'll be updated as and when new content is updated by yours truly. Now, I'm planning for the next video to be uploaded, uploaded maybe in the middle of January, as I do have family plans for the coming weekend, uh, and I do have uh, some work commitments after that. All that remains for me is to wish you all, from my family to yours, a, a safe, healthy, and lively new year. And there's nothing quite like laughter to soothe the aching mind. And I'll see you all, quite literally, on the flip side.